there's been a fair amount of fear-mongering in the news about artificial intelligence. You know, we're told with perhaps some justification in some far future that AI could compete with us. Uh, but in the near term, we're also told, you know, self-driving cars and trucks will wipe out millions of human jobs. Uh, there's a study from Oxford University that uh, something like 47% uh, of human tasks, many of them including white collar jobs, could be eliminated in the next 20 years. We keep hearing again and again that technology is going to wipe out human jobs. And I want to talk a little bit about why I don't buy that, right? I, when I hear stories like, you know, we're going to need universal basic income, a good idea to be sure. Uh, you know, I really ask myself, is there really nothing left for humans to do? You know, so while UBI might be a good idea, it reminds me of this fabulous quote from T.S. Eliot where he said, this last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. You know, we don't need UBI because there's nothing for humans to do. We need it perhaps because it's a better way to organize our society and fight inequality. But let me address this question of why we're never going to run out of jobs. Uh, my friend Nick Hanauer, who spoke at my Next Economy Summit last year, uh, has this great line. He said, technology is the solution to human problems. We won't run out of work till we run out of problems. Now, I just want to ask you, are we done yet? Are we really done? You know, every entrepreneur asks that question. What needs doing? And some of them end up coming up with fairly trivial answers. And some of them come up with big, world-changing ideas. And those big, world-changing ideas are all around us. We have to have the courage to go for them. You know, so when I saw a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mark and Priscilla announced that, you know, they want to fund efforts to eliminate all diseases within their children's lifetime, you go, yeah, yeah, go for it, go for it. You know, even if you don't succeed, you will win. All right? And we see that already, the role that technologies like artificial intelligence are playing. Uh, Google's DeepMind working on applying you know, deep learning to detecting eye disease is in their first experiments. There's also startups uh, like Analytics started here in, in Silicon Valley, which is again using AI to scan millions of, of tissue samples to try to detect disease uh, more effectively than humans. There's Jeff Huber over at Grail who's trying to develop an early blood test for cancer. This is all amazing, amazing stuff. People who are saying, what do you mean? you know, we're going to run out of jobs. There's so much to do. You know, think about climate change. I sometimes think that climate change is going to become the equivalent for us of World War II for our parents' and grandparents' generation. You know, where effectively we had a massive challenge that just slapped us upside the head, made us wake up and say, we got work to do. You know, what really pulled us out of the Great Depression was... Partly it was social policy, and that was super important, but it was really the fact that we had challenges. I'm going to come back to that later. Climate change brings us enormous challenges, and we will need every bit of help we can get, including the help of AI, robotics, and the most advanced technologies we can imagine, uh, genetic engineering, to solve those problems. How about war? You know, after World War II, we, we look at this prosperous Europe. Do you know what? Italy and France looked like Syria. That picture is from today. There are similar pictures of Italy and France from 1945. Yet we rebuilt Europe and we can rebuild the world. And we need to take that on as a challenge. Make the world prosperous. So that history of what happened uh, around the turning point into that last great flowering of the economy that we look back on now with some nostalgia actually has a lot of similarities to today. You know, there were homeless encampments in Washington, D.C., just like there are homeless encampments today in San Francisco. Uh, Lewis Hyman uh, is a wonderful historian of, of uh, debt. Uh, in his latest book, kind of describes the patterns of what happened then and what happens now. 
you know, in 1930. You know, you think about this. This is the depths of the Great Depression. Guess what? When was the Golden Gate Bridge built? When was the Empire State Building built? When were all these massive dams built? We actually undertook big projects, big challenges. We invested in infrastructure. You know, Lewis talks about the fact that in 1930, only 10% of U.S. homes had electricity. Ten years later, it was up to 60%. We, the electrification of America happened during the Great Depression. And then as we kicked over you know, into the great challenges of World War II, we also invested in the future. Industries like aerospace, plastics, chemicals, uh, all were born in that sort of humans rising to the challenge. And then we entered a period of great post-war prosperity where we saw that the results of our productivity were distributed more widely. We invested in education for returning GIs. We invested in education for everyone in this country. And we basically built a great economy through the choices that we made. So when you see the stories today about income inequality and you hear the stories that somehow it's an inevitable result of globalization. It's an inevitable result of changes in technology. I want you to call bullshit on that. It's a result of human choices and the wrong choices. We do not need to make those choices. We can make different choices. And every entrepreneur should be out there going, I have a role to play in helping our society to make better choices, to make a better world for everyone. So David Rolfe uh, of the SEIU had this great line. He said, you know, when we look back on these good jobs of the 50s and 60s, it's really important to remember, God did not make being an auto worker a good job. This is something that was achieved through struggle, through policy, through negotiation, and through choices that we made as human beings. And that's why I wrote a piece recently called To Survive, The Game of Business Needs to Update Its Rules. There's a lot of talk where people act as though the rules of the economy are like the laws of physics. And yes, there are laws of physics, just like there are laws of physics in basketball, in football. But they overlaid on them are a set of rules that make the game fun and interesting and worth playing. And we've increasingly built a set of rules in our economy that have made it not a very fun place for most of the world's population. It may be a lot of fun for people like Carl Icahn, but if you're a worker at Walmart or McDonald's or you've lost your job entirely, you go, how did we get here? How did we get here? And why are policymakers doing nothing about this? And you guys should all be asking yourselves that and remembering that this is the result of choices is not inevitable. I think in this regard, sometimes it'd be really interesting to see whether AI could actually teach us anything about how to make more interesting adjustments to the rules of the game. I think of the victory of AlphaGo over Lee Sedol. The thing that struck me most in the commentary was how Lee Sedol lost. But he learned new things. All the commentators described some of the games as the most beautiful and interesting games they'd ever seen. And the one game that Lee Sedol won, he made a move that nobody had contemplated. This is amazing. When we fight with big, hard things, we get better. So the second reason why I don't think we're ever going to run out of jobs is something that, as a result of something that Clayton Christensen called the law of conservation of attractive profits. And that is, what he, he said, uh, when attractive profits disappear at one stage in the value chain because a product becomes modular and commoditized, the opportunity to earn attractive profits with proprietary products uh, will usually emerge in an adjacent stage. Now, Clay and I had kind of a mind meld about this back in 2004 when he wrote this because I was giving a series of talks about what was happening in the technology economy. And I pointed out how uh, Microsoft's dominance had occurred as a result of the commodification of hardware with the PC, which allowed Microsoft to win out over IBM. 
And I said, look, the same thing is happening today with the open standards of the internet, uh, with open source software. Uh, everybody who's fighting against Microsoft, don't worry about that. Look ahead and say something else is going to become valuable. And I made the prediction that it was going to be big data and uh, uh, collective intelligence. And of course, uh, that was the rise of Google and uh, Facebook and companies like that. And so it's super important to understand this commodification uh, and then value add in some new area. So as AI and technology reduces certain jobs to commodities, something else becomes valuable. Now, what is that in this next stage? Well, there's at least one area that you can identify very easily, and that is the value add that comes through design and through creativity. So when you think back on the rise of Apple, remember, this was, uh, these are images from the original Think Different ads. You may rem remember those. You know, what Apple did was remarkable. And actually, it became clear to me what the design pattern here was when I read a wonderful book by art critic Dave Hickey called Air Guitar. And in it, there's an article called The Birth of the Big Beautiful Art Market. And it's actually about the auto industry. And he describes how after World War II, the automobile went from being something that people bought for functional reasons to something that they bought as a symbol of status, something they bought on the basis, as he said, of what it means instead of what it does. And that was his definition of an art market, where a product is bought on the basis of what it means, not what it does. Now, that was the heart of Steve Jobs' genius as a marketing leader. He said, using my products means that you are a different kind of person. And you look, Apple became the most valuable company in the world on the back of this value add on top of really what was at that time a fiercely commoditized product. Now sure, there was a lot of product innovation, but it was amazing value add. So this is true throughout our economy. Think about restaurants. You know, food has become a commodity. You know, it's cheap. Food is so cheap compared to what it used to be that we can't even imagine. And yet, there's immense competition between restaurants, right, where we're trying different styles of food, different, uh, you know, nationalities, different chefs are innovating, competing. A great city is a testament to what happens when you have commodity products. Right? And when people exercise their creativity to add value to those products. I mean, we're not all sitting around eating the lowest cost slop. Oh, well, actually, maybe some of us are. I mean, <laughs> you, know, you know, but even Soylent is a product to which a sort of an intellectual value has been added. There's a message tied to it. Just like there's a message tied to organic, gluten-free, local, you know, this is the human value added to what would otherwise be a commodity product. And then the uh, closely related is this idea of status. Uh, I've always loved this quote from uh, Samuel Johnson. He was the guy who wrote the first dictionary of the English language, but he was also a remarkable essayist and poet, uh, one of my favorite authors, actually. And he wrote a short novel uh, in uh, uh, the late 1700s uh, called Rasselas. Actually, it was uh, mid-1700s, 1753. And he, he, he said, I consider the pyramids to be a monument to the insufficiency of all human enjoyments. He who was built for use till use is supplied must begin to build for vanity. That's also this huge, you know, thread in, a, in, in rich economies. I thought about this recently reading The New Yorker. There's this amazing article about plastic surgery. You know, between one-fifth and one-third of women in Seoul have gone under the knife, right? Why, right? So, again, humans figure out things to do if we let them. And that's uh, my second reason why we'll never run out of jobs. Uh, the third, and, uh, you know, one that's really important to remember is the vibrancy of an economy actually comes through continuous transformation. So there was recently a study uh, from Goldman Sachs which pointed out that the full transformation, even for, you know, assuming that autonomous vehicles proceed apace without regulatory hiccups and so on, will take till 2060. That's because actually turning over the sort of the, uh, you know, what we do now to the things that we do in the future 
are, is in fact a huge economic driver. So innovation, in, in fact, is the engine, independent of any of the actual content of it, innovation is the engine of the economy. But we do have a responsibility to get the transformation right, because increasingly we are ruled by systems that we do not understand. Uh, John Madison, who's the chief medical information officer at Kaiser, uh, said to me uh, recently, uh, actually it was a few years ago, he said the great question of the 21st century is going to be, whose black box do you trust? We have to actually get inside, we have to understand how we're going to manage systems. Long before we get to, you know, you know, super intelligence, we have to understand that we are increasingly building systems that we don't understand and don't fully control. But ultimately, I want you all to remember that as we go through the disruption of today and the difficulties, they're real, there's so much ahead of us. The weavers of Ned Ludd's rebellion of 1811, those guys, the weavers who said these machine looms are destroying our livelihood, were right. Their livelihood was at risk. And the early part of the 18th century was a terrible time uh, of economic disruption. But those weavers couldn't imagine that their grandchildren would have more and better clothes than the kings of Europe. They couldn't imagine that their you know, great-great-grandchildren would be eating the fruits of summer in the depths of winter, something that was possible only for the very richest people of the world uh, at that time. They couldn't imagine that we would build cities in the desert with a building that's a half a mile high. They didn't imagine that we would go into space, that we'd fly through the air, that we would dig a tunnel under the English Channel all the way to France. All these things became possible because we harnessed the productivity of the first machine age to do amazing things and to make society richer. And that's what we have to do today with technologies like AI. And I want to come back to that story of Lee Sedol struggling against a machine that pushed him to the ultimate limit. And to bring a story uh, and a poem that I've always loved, it's a poem by Rainier Maria Rilke uh, describing Jacob wrestling with the angel. It's an Old Testament story. And Rilke describes how the wrestlers of the Old Testament used to regularly wrestle with angels. And they never won. They never won. But they came away stronger from the fight. And Rilke's poem ends with this magnificent invocation, which I'm really paraphrasing here. He said, what we fight with is so small, and when we win, it makes us small. This is how we grow, by being defeated decisively by constantly greater beings. So I urge you, as you think about your life going forward, find new challenges, embrace new challenges, and struggle with the angels. Thank you very much.